Greetings, this is Lessons on Leadership from George Washington University's School of Business. I'm your host, James Bailey. Our guest today is Burley Brunson. Burley Brunson is the Senior Vice President of uh, Logistics Specialty, Inc. And in that role, he focuses on supporting teams in executing business development strategies. Prior to that, he had a long and successful career with Lockheed Martin at various times serving in the defense component, the electronics component, as well as the strategy component of their business. His teams at Lockheed Martin were three times awarded the prestigious Nova Award, which is the firm's highest distinction for innovation and teamwork. Burley holds a BS and a PhD in oceanography. He has an executive MBA from here at George Washington University. He was two times elected the president of the GWSB EMBA Alumni Association. He is on our board of advisors and just this last year received the Distinguished Alumni Service Award from the university. Burley, welcome. Thank you, James. It's nice to be here with you today. Good. Thanks for taking the time. I want to start a little bit personally. Um, about you, issues okay. about you and your background. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Southern California uh, most of the time. I, I went to high school in Anaheim, California. At the time, it was a small city, about 25,000, and then came Disney. Okay. Disneyland moved in in 1955, and from that, the city has grown to about 375,000. So when I was going there, it was kind of a quiet little town full of orange groves and strawberry fields. And as I said, then came Mickey Mouse, changed the whole landscape. Uh, my first uh, six years of school, I went to five schools. So we moved around a lot. Uh, my, fa my father was uh, a carpenter, my mother was a nurse, and we went wherever the work was. Uh, we landed in Orange County, California, which, because of the tremendous building right. boom that was going on there in the mid-50s. Yeah. Uh, where were you in the birth? How many children in your family? Well, there were three, three okay. of us. I have two younger sisters. I was the eldest. You were the eldest. Yes, okay. I was uh, you know, number one. You know, the, uh, there's a lot of interesting research on birth order, and you probably are aware of it, that uh, oldest children tend to be especially responsible um, they work well within hierarchies, uh, and actually CEOs come disproportionately from the ranks of the firstborn children. That makes sense with you in terms of your own life and how you've approached your your uh, corporate uh, career. I think so. As a as a you know firstborn boy, the only male in the in the of the children, uh, a lot was expected of me, myself included. I expected a lot of myself, and so I was a high achiever. I I always had been, and. Yeah. I think my sisters looked up to me. At the time, they perhaps uh, weren't, weren't so happy with my, uh, my, quote, leadership style, which was a bit autocratic, I have to admit. I've, I've learned since then. But uh, we're still close. We're still good friends. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so they haven't uh, uh, thrown me out. Did you have any hobbies as a child? Anything that you really loved? Anything that really just sort of transported you that you couldn't wait to do? I read a lot, okay. I, I, and I still do. I enjoy reading. Uh, now, of course, I do it electronically uh, on, a, right. on a Kindle or something like right. that. But at the time, I loved books. If you go to my house now, you'll probably find that we have several hundred books. Uh, matter of fact, we just got rid of uh, 10 boxes, and it didn't make a dent. Okay. Uh, so reading was, was a, something I spent a lot of time doing. Tell me about your first position at Lockheed Martin and what your career path was there. How did that move forward? I joined Lockheed Martin in, in 1991. I was coming from a small business where I was chief operating officer, and we had worked with Lockheed at the, uh, prior to that. And uh, frankly, I outgrew the little company, and I was looking for some opportunity. Uh, Lockheed uh, had established a new division in New Hampshire, since it was the uh, Undersea Warfare Division, and they asked me to come to New Hampshire and lead that. So I went to Lockheed in 1991 as vice president, general manager of the Undersea Warfare Division. I was up there a little over a year uh, doing some very fascinating cutting edge technology, advanced technology programs. Uh, we actually got those on track, moved them, moved them into production, which wasn't so much fun for me anymore. Uh, and I took the opportunity to come on the staff of the chairman of Lockheed. And we established the first ever high, highly classified broadband high speed network that connected Sunnyvale, California to Washington, D.C. Okay. in a classified environment so that we could demonstrate to our local customers what we were doing in California without them having to take a 3,000 mile trip. Uh, uh, that gave me the opportunity, in working in that environment with a minimal amount of travel, to actually go back to school and get my MBA here at George Washington. Uh, the interesting thing about that is my next, my next job, I moved into a vice president role uh, down in Crystal City working directly with the Pentagon and somewhat with Congress. And right at the time I got my, my 
my MBA, Lockheed and Martin merged. That's right. I always forget that they were separate companies. They were separate, yeah. and in 1995, I got my MBA in May of 1995. They merged in March of 1995. Uh, my job turned out to be um, the person responsible for bringing the cultures of the 22 separate divisions together, working together in Washington, D.C. Um, and the, and the, the funny thing about it is the last paper I wrote at, at GW was why mergers fail. And the answer was culture. Right. So here I was charged then with 22 cultures. Uh, some of these had come out of the Laurel Corporation, Lockheed, Martin. How do you bring them together into a cohesive team? Where the mantra was one company, one team. Uh, and as you can imagine, we brought 22 companies together. Uh, we didn't exactly have a common set of practices. And so my job then, which once again fit right in with the education I'd received, was to come together and, and, and establish a set of standard practices. What I realized is a company that diverse, you cannot do uh, standard processes. What you have to do are process standards. Okay. So I, I took the standards approach. I don't care how you do it, here's what you have to do. Here's what you have to end up with. I felt I, I benefited from that, Good. doing it in an academic environment. Good. Uh, and then applying that immediately, being able to apply that to a real world situation. Very broadly, thinking about sort of leadership philosophically, mm -hmm. um, is leadership about the person or is it about the moment? Is it about the, the individual or the situation? Is it, uh, is it the leader, him or herself, or is it the, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, that they, they just have leadership qualities, some sort of innate leadership qualities, or is this something that can be um, educated? It's something that can be taught. And believe me, I hope it's the latter because I'm a leadership professor and there wouldn't be work for people like me. Um, but how do, you, how do you disentangle those two? You use words that I believe come together. Individuals must rise to the moment. Okay. And so I think leadership is about individuals, but it's about how they respond to time, to what's going on. Okay. You know, true leaders rise to the moment, uh, capture the moment, if you will, seize the moment, uh, and, then, and then turn what might be a disaster into a success uh, just by their, by their uh, you know, just their sheer leadership, okay. uh, bringing their, their folks along, encouraging those around them and saying, okay, we can do this, let's go do it. Okay. With that in mind, is it possible that a leader, because you identified leadership with the individual, is it possible that an individual doesn't have the right qualities for the situation they're in, whether that situation is defined by an industry, a culture, a particular economic client, that they're not capable of rising to that moment because their qualities, their characteristics, aren't compatible with it. I think of, of startups, for example, startup corporations that are, that are started by a, a brilliant entrepreneur, yeah. and they reach a certain point in time, and that person, if he or she is smart, will step down. They'll move into the chief technology office, right. and they'll bring someone in who knows to right. lead people and organizations and grow them. And some of the most successful businesses are people who have recognized that they yeah. don't have it in that arena excellent. and are willing to step back and let someone who does step excellent. up. Excellent. That, that's an excellent point. I think you know, Steve Jobs might be the, the exception here of somebody who's both a founder, uh, a technical genius, extraordinarily innovative, but also has shown some very good managerial and leadership capabilities long term for that, uh, for Apple. Um, and a similar question, do you think leadership is that you have to have it? Or can you get it? Um, do leaders just have to possess these qualities, whether they're empathy, insight, expertise, uh, charisma, whatever it happens to be, or are the qualities of leadership something that you can develop, that you can learn, that can be taught? I, th I think they're both. I think, uh, I think the qualities of leaders have to be there. We talked about that just a moment again. ago. The, you know, the, there are certain qualities of, of an individual, if you will, the EQ side, uh, the emotional quotient side as a, of a leader. Uh, but you can also hone those, teach those, uh, improve those through practice and education. So while I believe there are certain innate abilities that come with leadership, uh, you're not necessarily a natural born leader. Okay. You may have the basic tools. Okay but they have to be brought out, honed, and developed. Okay, an analogy. I love analogies. You remember the old Miller's analogies test? Did anybody have to take those? Um, but my favorite analogy is leadership is to blank as management is to blank. Do you have one that might fit that analogy? Yeah, I think the one that comes to mind is, uh, is uh, leadership is to racing, particularly road racing, 
uh, as management is to driving. It's interesting. Uh, Elaborate a little bit. Road, road racing, I mean, there's a goal. There's a clear vision there. I'm going to win this race. Uh, but how am I going to win this race is left up to the driver. A lot of twists, a lot of turn, high speed, risk associated with it. If you make a mistake, you end up in the dirt or into somebody else's car. Uh, and so, so there's a risk factor on your way to the goal, if you will, which is winning the race. Right. Driving is very different. Right. It should be minimal risk. Right. Uh, that's why we have backup cameras. That's why we have speed limits. Right. That's why we have automatic signals that are lane changing if there's somebody in your blind spot. The idea of driving is, yes, there is a goal. I want to get to point okay. B from point A, okay. but I want to get, it, get to it in a very carefully prescribed manner. Stay in my lane, make the turns at the right place, go at the right speed. It's driving. Both okay. take skill, but they're very different types of skills. Right. So right. the difference right. between you know, leadership to me and management is the right. difference between racing and driving. Right. Well, some of this, by the way, race when we're supposed to be driving, but that aside, I like the analogy <laughs> because racing is inherently risky. Yes. Leadership is inherently risky. We're driving, your primary concern is safety. Um, and it's uh, you know, getting from one place to another place with as much safety as possible. Mm -hmm. So right. um, that's, uh, that's how I'd see those. A um, couple uh, just uh, last questions. Do you believe that organizations are, it's oftentimes said, that organizations are uh, overmanaged and underled? Do you agree with that? And if so, why? What are the things about organizations that lead us to privilege management above leadership? You, you hit on something earlier when you talked about what, what is management. And, and I think of it in terms of, let's think about the, the whole Lean Six Sigma movement. Uh, it was all about execution. It was all about taking out waste. It was all about doing it perfectly every time. And I would say, if you think about Toyota, Toyota was an extremely well-managed company. But it wasn't necessarily well-led and then they did it the other way around. They flipped it. They then began, I think of leadership as essentially, they wanted to become number one. They wanted to become the biggest car company in the world. Uh, and, and, and in that leadership, that vision of the biggest car company in the world, they lost the management. They started then turning out flawed vehicles, okay. which cost them the very okay. thing they had the vision for. Okay. Okay. So once again, the absolute necessity of both here. You've got to have both there. Both have to, to have exist. Both and they've got to be balanced properly. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with that. So uh, Lockheed Martin's trying to balance these things very Absolutely. consciously, Absolutely. very intentionally. Um, it's been my experience at organizations because management is more measurable. It's more objective. You can mm -hmm. get your hands around it where leadership is more amorphous. It's mm -hmm. more subjective. It's, um, that, the measurement issue is one of the reasons why they tend to privilege uh, management over leadership as well as cultures oftentimes because cultures put us on the same page you know we uh, the point of culture is to right. get us all looking at things the same way and if you've got a whole and of course after a while we start to dress alike um, but uh, um, that leads people to perhaps see things in the same way and when you're doing that innovation creativity um, naturally kinds of goes away because you've got a language you've got a worldview that is consistent and it might prevent that leadership from getting the foothold right. that it needs um, I uh, similar to the Toyota story I think an example of organizations a whole industry that was overled and undermanaged would be the financial industry yes. um, because mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what happened to the risk management function you know those Chinese firewalls that were there to say no you can't trade this stuff uh, because there's no underlying value to it. But the ideas were um, exciting. Uh, you make money on nothing. And uh, so that was, might be an example of that. Have you yourself ever felt well led by another? I have a couple of times. I've, you know, I had a fairly lengthy, lengthy career. Uh, but early on in my career, when I first went to work for the government, uh, I had a gentleman who, who led, who led well. He was a very senior at the time for me, it was a GS-15, and I was a you know, GS-9. And, but, but he gave us a vision, uh, told us what our goal was, and then let us do it. Okay. Very well led in that sense, and kept checking back. We were held accountable. We weren't okay. just let go free. He was always accessible. Okay. Uh, the same thing is true most recently. Uh, uh, my, last, my last boss was one of those uh, natural born leaders, if you will. Same kind of thing. He, he told us where we were going. He, he set the goals in front. We, we had twice a year reviews against objectives. The rest of the time, we were allowed to do it. And, uh, and you, felt, you, know, you felt that you were going to be held accountable. So there was never a free ride, if you will. But at the same time, you could do it your way. Okay. 
Okay. So the discretion component, the autonomy Absolutely. component was what yeah. uh, you learned or extracted most. That's when you feel well led is when somebody yeah. says, this is where we need to go. They express it to you in a compelling way. And then they say, but you've got the competence, you've got the expertise, you've got the skills to help us get there. Go do it. I'm not going to micromanage you. And, and the key thing with a leader like that is you've got to know as, as an individual that, uh, use the word, they've got your back. Yeah. They will, they will protect you. Uh, if you stumble, fail, uh, you know, you're not going to uh, essentially be, be killed for, for a right. mistake. Right. No, that's and, they excellent. Will, and they will protect you from, you know, whatever. In four words, give me four different things that followers want. I think they want vision. Okay. Vision from their, uh, from their leader. Uh, they want clear objectives. Okay. What do we have to do? Okay. I think they like uh, they like uh, freedom okay. to do it their way, and then of course they like to be acknowledged. Okay, okay. I think that's a really good. And, list. and the key the key on the acknowledgement part, I always use this: uh, you you praise in public, yeah. you admonish in private. Right. Good. Good. That's a very. That's a very. We ought to write that down somewhere. Um, that ought to be on all leadership guides because I think that makes an enormous amount of sense. Do you do that? Do you do that for your followers, the people who report I you do. to? Do you think about it every day? I do. Okay. I do. I'm uh, one of the most kind of almost seminal reviews I had was a 360, where you know you get the the peers, the employees. The only person you can determine in a 360 that's reviewing you is your boss. Yeah. You know who that is, and and we had a two-hour conversation about blind spots and in, in that in that discussion, and we both learned a lot about one another. And from that point on, I, I, my leadership style changed as a result of that 360. What I realized was I wasn't spending enough time explaining to the folks that worked for me why we were doing what we were doing, why it mattered, right. uh, and then giving them the freedom to do it their right. way. Good. Well, I think that goes back to the adoptability point that came from early childhood, your ability to adopt, to see that you could be doing something better, to respond to uh, feedback, and to uh, try to deliver something that you would want delivered to you, the autonomy, the, uh, the excitement that comes from a compelling vision. So, mm -hmm. um, so today we hope to have shown you uh, a very senior executive and their course to leadership, how their early life contributed to it, their uh, education, their career paths, their, their family engagements, how all of those came together. All of these different forces came together to create this idiosyncratic person, Burley Bunchen, and uh, to contribute to uh, his great success as a leader throughout his career. So, um, Burley, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. This is Lessons on Leadership.